Welcome back. I am Daniel from Rock the JVM, and in this video, we're going to be talking about Scala objects. Now, if you've paid attention so far, I've avoided the term object when referring to instances of classes, and that is because objects in Scala are a dedicated concept. Now, one of the fundamental aspects of object-oriented programming is something that we call class-level functionality. That means functionality that does not depend on an instance of a class. If you've noticed, everything that we have written so far had connection to an instance of some class at any given point. Now, there are cases where we really shouldn't need to do that. For example, universal constants or universal functionality that we should be able to access without relying on an instance of some class. Right. So here's how we would do that in a conventional language. So I'm going to go to Playground and I'm going to go to Java Playground and actually show you how we used to do it. So in Java, we would write a class because all the code resides in classes. And let's say I have some constants relating to the class person. I'm actually going to delete the public modifier so that the code can actually compile. And if all the persons have, for example, two eyes, this uh, is universal to the class person, we would write public, static, and then final int so that it's a constant and uh, not modifiable, and call this n eyes and equals two. So this is how we define a constant that does not rely on an instance of person to access it. And if we wanted to uh, print this, the value of this constant, we would use person dot n eyes. So we would access the n eyes field from the class person, not from an instance of person. This is called class level functionality. And it's one of the fundamental aspects of object oriented programming. Now I'm going to go back to Scala. And I'm going to begin by saying in all caps that Scala does not have class level functionality. So Scala does not know the concept of static. It actually has something even better, and it's called objects. So an object can actually have this kind of static-like functionality. Here's what I mean. So uh, the equivalent in Scala for that little Java code that we wrote earlier would be, and let me switch to my presentation mode, object person. So notice the keyword. And I'm going to open the curly braces like I would define a class. And I'm going to say val and eyes equals two. This is how Scala defines quote unquote class level functionality. And the way that we would access it would be just to print line person dot and eyes just like we did in Java. There are a number of important conceptual differences between this approach and the Java approach that I'm going to explain and go through them one by one. But before that, just know that an object can have values or vars and can also have method definitions. So if I define a method can fly, which returns a Boolean, and um, I suppose the implementation is false, then this is a valid method definition. So objects can be defined in a similar way that classes can, with the exception that objects do not receive parameters. So you can define vals, vars, and methods inside objects, and you can access them as you would in a class level setting. So if I say person can fly, then uh, I should receive the number two and uh, the string false at the console. So the starting point is that to use class level definition in Scala, we use objects. Now, let's start with explaining the differences. In Scala, we use an object as a singleton instance. So Scala object is a singleton instance. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that when I define the object person, I basically define its type, but I also define its only instance. So the object is its own type, 
person, plus it is its only instance. That is if I create a val, let's say Mary, and I attribute the value person with a capital P to Mary, this thing is an instance. This is the instance of the person type, which is the only instance that uh, this person type can have. If I have another value called John, which is also person, if I print line the fact that Mary and John are equal in the sense that they point to the same instance, I'm going to see the value true here in the console. All right, that is because Mary and John point to the same instance, which is the object called person. So another advantage of Scala objects is that they are singleton instances by definition without any other code needed from you. So this is pretty cool. Now, a pattern that's often used in practice is that we write objects and classes with the same name, so class person, in the same file or even in the same scope. For practical reasons, this is to separate instance level functionality from quote unquote static or class level functionality. So we split the functionality between classes and objects. This pattern of writing classes and objects with the same name in the same scope is called companions. So the class person and the object person are companions because they reside in the same scope and have the same name. So what we achieve here in this design with companions is that the whole code that we'll ever write will reside in either a class and we can access it from an instance or it will reside inside of a singleton object and we can access that by accessing the singleton object, which means that all the code that we're ever going to access will be accessed from some kind of instance, either a regular instance or the singleton instance. That means Scala is actually a truly object-oriented language. So Scala is actually more object-oriented than most object-oriented languages, including Java, which is kind of funny because Scala was designed as a functional language, and it's actually very successful at it, as we'll see in the functional programming uh, section. But I digress. Now, let's clarify some uh, things with this uh, companions design pattern in Scala so that we don't get confused later on. So what I mentioned at the beginning was that if you define an object called, in this case, person, then this guy is the only instance of its type. Now, if you also declare a companion class for this, say class person, then this statement is not entirely true. Let me show you what I mean. So if I declare a class person, then I can actually instantiate it. So if I say val Mary is a new person, and val John is also a new person, then Mary and John are not going to be equal because they refer to different instances. So this time we'll print false to the console. So basically, I can instantiate two different instances of the class person. What I meant when I said that the object person is a singleton is that you cannot say val person1 equals person and val person2 equals also person, and these two are different. So if you print line person1 equals person2, then we're going to see true to the console. All right. So when I say that this is a singleton object, what I mean by that is that there is a single instance that can be referred to with the name person. So keep this subtle distinction in mind. Cool. Let's expand now this design pattern. Often in practice, we have factory methods in the singleton objects. So say, for example, the person has a uh, val name as a class field, right? Of course, this code will not compile now because Mary and John need to have some names. So let's give this Mary and John. 
Okay. Now, in the person object, we have, in practice, usually, we have factory methods that can build persons. So in this case, I'm going to define a from method, which takes a mother and a father and uh, results in a new person that is a child. So if I get a mother, which is a person, and a father, which is also a person, and the return type is person, and the implementation is not really relevant. Let's say it's called it's a new person with a name Bobby. Bobby. Then this from method is called a factory method because its sole purpose is to build persons given some parameters. So the way that we use that in practice is to say val Bobby equals person dot from. Mary a John. But often in practice, these factory methods are called in a very convenient way, apply instead of some other name. So instead of from, we can simply call apply with Mary and John. We, or we can actually delete apply altogether and make the person singleton object callable like a function, which is pretty darn cool. So this actually looks like a constructor with a small difference that this is actually the apply method in the person singleton object. So this pattern is widely used in practice. Cool. Now the final thing that I want to show you, which is new, is Scala applications. This is the point where you actually understand why this code is runnable. So I want to uh, start by saying that a Scala application is only a Scala object with a very, very important and very particular method. It's called def main, which receives an array of string as a parameter. Now the method needs to have this exact definition with a uh, returning unit at the end, because Scala applications are turned into Java virtual machine applications whose entry point have to be static, public static void main with an array of string as a parameter. Now we've seen that the void return type in Scala is unit and the static in uh, Java is translated into a single, uh, a plain method in Scala objects. So Scala applications have to be Scala objects with this method. So if I delete, for example, the extends app thing right over here, then if I right click here, the ID will not run my code anymore. But if I define this method with this exact signature and I put my code inside, okay, just indent to look good, then suddenly this application is runnable again, right? So I can actually right click and run and the code will run as expected. So a Scala application is a Scala object with this exact method implemented. Either that, or if you want a shorter way, you can uh, delete this main method and actually say at the beginning extends app, which already has a def main method. All right, lessons learned. So we started with the fact that Scala does not have static values or methods in the way that other languages do for creating class level functionality, if you will. Scala has something even better, and this is called Scala objects. So object in the context of Scala is a separate concept. A Scala object is in its own type and is the only instance of that type in the sense that if two things point to a Scala object, then they are equal. A major advantage of Scala objects is that they can implement the singleton pattern in one line of code or without any other boilerplate or any other code whatsoever needed from you. And we've seen one in practice. We've also discussed that Scala objects and Scala classes can stay in the same scope, and these are called companions. Companions can e access each other's private members, at, as we will see later in this section, and we've found out that all the code that we write 
can only be accessed in an instance of something, which makes Scala more object-oriented than most object-oriented languages in existence. And we've seen an example. We've also discussed about Scala applications, which are either Scala objects with this method, def main with an array of string as an argument and returning unit, or something which extends app, a Scala object extending the app type. All right, wrapping up, I'm Daniel, and I hope you found this video useful. I'm going to see you very soon.